Our fact for today, this particular case study that we're going to cover in regard to uh, bailing equipment will save its end user customer £28,000 per annum. Very impressive. Welcome back to the Corporate Sustainability Education Channel powered by the Southern Sustainability Partnership. Today we're joined by Managing Director of Pierce Compaction, Steve Mason, based in Verwood in Dorset. The company is one of the leading providers of baling and compacting equipment in the UK. They design and build their own equipment in Verwood, Dorset, and their award-winning solutions can be purchased outright or they can be leased. And also they do work to a circular economy loop in as much as equipment can be brought back to their factory when it's no longer needed by the customer, refurbish completely and go out as a new piece of equipment. Um, the company also don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk, they have an impressive sustainability policy and they have lovely shiny solar panel array on the roof. Um, so Steve, we're delighted that you're joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So Steve, I'd like to kick off then. Um, we're going to go into a bit of a case study, something yeah. that you've got coming up. Um, can you tell us the type of customer that we're going to be talking about here in as much as the industry sector that they work in and, and the kind of size of company? Cool. So the um, industry sector is the uh, a large sports arena. So obviously these um, this machinery can be used in any business that's producing an amount of waste probably around 50 to 60 pounds per week if you're spending any more than that then the chances are we can save you money but this particular case study is on a sports arena local to us okay so what was the uh, what's the issue that they have that um you know got them to get in touch with you in the first place yeah so they were just spending a massive amount of money um the way their system worked was they had a, a number of wheelie bins dotted around the um, around the area, and we had, they had a dust cart come in every well, twice a week to collect thirty six bins, so it was seventy two wheelie bins per week. Um, they contacted I think they contacted us to uh, to try and reduce their waste costs. Wow, that's a lot of wheelies. I think. Oh, it's massive, people, massive amounts. Yeah. I don't think people would expect those sorts of numbers. Yeah, that is big. I think so what happens you... is people become complacent. They they have ten wheelie bins and then they get a little bit busier in another area and they just add another wheelie bin. Add another, and before you know it, you're up to twenty bins. Obviously, the waste collector is not going to say anything because it's in their interest to have more bins on site um, because they can come and collect and empty more at any one given time. So I think it 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 grows. Normally, with the businesses, the waste will obviously grow with it. Yeah, and then you need some or you need people to actually talk to each other, and yeah. uh, then that raises itself as an issue. Okay, so obviously the conversation is had. Um, you send somebody out to them to uh, to look at their their issue. Um, yep. Can you give our listeners a bit of an idea about what happens during that that site visit? Um, you know, and what uh, what people would need to um, prepare for you to come on site. What are you okay, looking yeah, for? So we, we normally speak to them beforehand to try and, if they can get any information of their incumbent supplier to hand, that makes for a more accurate quote. Um, but really, all we need to see is the site and the waste. So when we come there, we will look at the, what you currently do, how you currently do it. So we'll have a look at your wheelie bins. We'll look in the wheelie bins or roll in... Uh, roll on skips or front end loaders. Um, we'll have a look and see if there's a chance of segregating waste. Because obviously that's the ideal. If we can set, excuse me, if we can segregate, then we can recycle. Um, and that's that's the optimum. So if we can segregate, great. If not, then we'll look at what you're doing. So for example, on this current one, they had 36 bins empty twice a week that they couldn't segregate. So therefore we had to look at a better way of doing that. And that was just to put in one of our compactors. So when we when we arrive on site, we'll walk around with you, we'll have a look and we'll make notes to be able to come back to you with a, a formal proposal. Okay, so um, in, obviously that number of wheelie bins going in and out, obviously they've got room on site for the bins themselves, but that doesn't necessarily correlate as to where your equipment will be, will be um, hosted. 
So how do you go about sort of looking at a site in terms of where your equipment could be, um, you know, handled? Yeah, so I mean, forgetting about that site, if, if you were to, our smallest machine is a, a wheelie bin press. So um, it takes up the same space as a wheelie bin. If you were to have, for easy math, six wheelie bins per week emptied, um, that's going to cost you around about £15 a bin, and it's taken up a fair amount of space. So what we would propose is we put in one of our bin presses and you just get two wheelie bins, which is going to save you some room and also save you about 40 to 50 pounds per week. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a straightforward process. You're going to get three bins into one with that small machine. So therefore you need a third of the bins. Um, and that's pretty much how it works. Obviously the more bins you have, the bigger machines we go, we do a range of about 14 or 15 different types of machinery that whether you're recycling or general waste or wet waste or, um, all different types really a machine will suit that that bill so it all depends on what space you've got how much you have got and how you want to deal with it really so really what we're saying here is that these solutions can be as flexible as you need them to be in terms of you know you can suit a fit fit the solution to fit the site which is fantastic because what you know this sort of um in you know, idea is that um, one solution doesn't fit all, and you certainly and no, no um, two sites are the same. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. in terms of like we sort of covered how a customer should prepare for you to come for that visit, but I guess what we're saying here is that you know maybe if you if you spend a couple of weeks or so just sort of looking at what's going um, leaving the building, what's going in and out, and then have that person on site for your meeting that has that knowledge to hand really, and that's all that they need to they need to do of course i mean i in an ideal world you you reduce your waste that's the hierarchy of waste is reduced reuse recycle if we, if we can reduce it at the start great if you can't because there's a lot of times you can't do that then reuse it a lot of people reusing the packaging to send out other products that's perfect but if you can't do that then you need to look at the recycle and every business no matter how perfect you are at segregating and recycling there's always going to be a residual waste at the end which you need to dispose of um which if we can help reduce costs in doing that and maybe do it a little bit more environmentally friendly so for example with that case study of the wheelie bins i was speaking of if you had enough space and you could keep all the bins on site instead of the dust cart coming in once a week for two bins they could come in once every three weeks for six bins therefore the dust cart is off the road two out of the three journeys yeah so you can sometimes point people in the right direction of where they could uh contact someone to find out how they could maybe use some of their waste um in other areas or where they could it could maybe just not go to landfill yeah yeah of course absolutely yeah, yeah. okay so okay you've had your site meeting you've gone back yeah. to hq um could you give us an idea of how you go about um looking at the information that you come away with and how you come up with the solution for that that particular customer of course so we will obviously we'd start writing a formal proposal um we'd outline exactly what you guys do currently then we'd put maybe one or two different proposals together that we think would work best for you um that would outline costs outline collections um and any other information you may need will be on that proposal. You can then take it away, have a look at it. It's an obligation. And if it's of any interest, then come back to us and we can we can go further forward. Excellent. So, you know, working in uh, corporate sustainability, um, we understand that every customer out there is looking for that one sort of silver bullet, if you like. They you know they're looking for the cost of what they're going to buy versus the payback time. Yeah. Um, so how do you calculate the cost of the machinery versus the cost of the waste that your customer's dealing with and then come up with their sort of, you know, the answer to that question? They're inevitably going to ask you. Yeah, of course. Um, the financial guys normally start asking them sorts of questions towards the end, if I'm honest. Um, but it is a it's, it's a really easy one to answer. I mean, at the moment, any business will be paying to get rid of their waste. So they're not they haven't got an initial outlay. We have our own rental book where all the machines we design and build here, we rent direct to the customers ourselves. So if at any point in the duration of the, the rental, you want to change the machine, you can upgrade, go a bit smaller. We can do that in-house because there's no finance companies involved. But going back to the question of the, on the return of investment, we would 
you're currently already spending money. So instead of paying out 90 pounds a week for six wheelie bins, you'll be paying out 20 pound a week for the machine plus two wheelie bins at 15 pounds per week. So you haven't got any um, capital investment because you're paying it weekly already now and you'll be paying it weekly going forward. So the return on investment, there is no real investment if you go on a rental side of things because you're already spending the money and you'll just continue to spend the money, but less of it to a different person. Do you find, I well, spent about five years in the renewable energy sector and I used to find commercially, when we talked to customers, they there was a, an average sort of expectation from them as to pay back, um, which, you know, always thought you need to look at the um, short term, yes, but really you need to be looking at the medium to long term. Do you tend to find that there's an average with with uh, companies as to when they expect that payback time to be and whether it's realistic? Um, I suppose it all depends on what industry they're in. I mean, the beauty of being a manufacturer is we design and build the machine to last. We have our own rent, like I mentioned just now, we have our own rental book. So it's, on, it's in our interest that that machine at the end of five years will continue to do another job for another five years and then another job for another five years. Um, it's pointless making a machine that's only going to go out once and then have to be thrown in the bin. That's not what we're about. So, I mean, a lot of people will rent their machine for five years. And then at the end of that term, they've got some options, whether you continue renting the existing machine, you can upgrade to a new machine. Um, if you continue renting the existing machine, which there would be nothing wrong with it, we can reduce the rental cost, therefore saving you a little bit more money. Um, but as for return on investments, because they are renting it and they're already spending the money, there is no capital investment. People don't need that capex to go out and buy the machine. They can use that for something else in their business to maybe make some money. Okay, so um, I take it then that they get the quote of the proposal through via email. Is that is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. And so how how does how is that relayed? I mean, is is it um, you know is there charts? Is there graphs? Is it just quite you know is it quite self-explanatory in other words yeah a lot of them are very self-explanatory you get the odd occasional complicated one where there's multiple sites and they're moving ways from one to another but nine times out of ten it is a case of you're currently spending this if you buy this or rent this you'll currently be you'll, you'll be spending this the saving is this it's not very complicated okay. it's quite straightforward so you try and make it as straightforward as possible yeah okay um so when is it that you mentioned about, you know, rental, but when is the question usually broached about the purchasing outright or leasing a solution or maybe going for a refurbish? When does that conversation take place? That would normally take place in the initial meet site meeting. But when we send the proposal and quote through to you, to you you'll have both options on there. So it'd be the outright purchase price and also the rental price. Um, I'll be honest. 85 90 percent of our customers go rental rather than outright purchase uh, it's the same like, with people in cars nowadays most businesses choose to rent cars rather than buy them outright it gives you a bit more flexibility there is a tax benefit to it also um, and you're better off keeping the cash in the bank for something that you can do something with that's very interesting actually because obviously for businesses that's not something that they have the option to do very often and this does just make perfect sense um, that you can do it that way. If somebody then says, no, I do want to buy it outright. Do you yeah. have any any advice, any guidance that you can put their way in terms of finance options? Or is that not something that you ever have, have you know, really need to deal with? No, no. I mean, occasionally people do want to use their own finance company. So we deal with a company that actually part of their business is a finance company. So they put it through their own finance house, which is absolutely fine. And we can deal with them, uh, help deal with them and any information they need, we can give to them. Um, but on the whole, most people go down the rental route and go outright purchase. That's absolutely fine. You know, we're only at the end of the phone. If they need any anything, we're here. And in five years time, they may still want to upgrade or look to part exchange that one in. Same, same as a car, it's, it's not a problem at all. Yeah, I think what the ideal thing with you, uh, your company as well, is that obviously when you first go out to see a company, they might be at one stage in their growth and development. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you grow with them. Um, yeah. and you can help them to upgrade when, when necessary. Um, so once they have agreed on a solution and they've placed their order, um, can you 
sort of talk us through the next stage in the process and the, and the usual lead time that they can expect? Yeah, so depending on the machine, the smaller end of the scale, we tend to try and keep stock. So we have shells or chassis built in stock at the factory that we can then paint, assemble and send out. Um, we do offer any company to have it in their corporate colours. So we don't spray them and keep them in stock as standard. So if someone wants it in pink with yellow spots, we can do that. It's not a problem. Um, so we put on the smaller side of the machines, two to three weeks. Um, on the bigger stuff, it can go up to six, seven weeks. It all depends on what's going through the factory at the time. We always, as well, we, we like to try and every customer we will invite down to the factory, maybe not current at the current situation, but we try and say to people, come down and have a look. You can see it being built. You can see what we're all about. It just, I think it, um, and trust us more about confidence as well because it'd be nice it's nice to be able to see where the machine's coming from it might sound a little bit silly but a lot of companies do like to come down and see it being painted or see it being assembled or you know, see the process and see what we're all about again um what an unusual you know thing because i've you know you rarely hear about something like that and and where where so much is uh, has got made in China or whatever on it actually is quite um, incredible that it's built locally or built in the UK at least. And if they choose to come and look at it, and of course um, as a team we've been to your facility and it is very impressive to see um, you know that equipment and the and the building process. Um, so how does a client prepare for install day then? So we've obviously done probably best part of all. 12, 13,000 installs over the last 20 odd years. Um, so we've ironed it out to a perfect military operation. Um, we have some very detailed questions we send out to the customer and ask them to fill it in uh, along the lines of opening and closing times to site access to electricity supplies put in place, um, all different bits and bobs. It's quite a, a long drawn out process. And quite often if they're having problems with that, the salesperson who did the initial site visit will go in and help them with that. Um, once some questions are back, we can then look at it, make sure we've got the right lorry, the right type of engineer going in, um, any special requirements on the machine, different plugs, power lead length, anything like that will be sorted out in the factory. Machine then turns up on the day and the engineer shortly behind it put into place and press the button and away she goes, hopefully. Well, wonderful hand-holding there. And uh, I was going to say what happens when you arrive on site. I suppose I was going to say pass the cup of coffee um, as soon as you, you know, expect yeah. as soon as you arrive. Well, that, that sounds great. Okay. Um, so lovely, shiny new machines installed. Um, you go away. Um, what support can a customer expect after you have left site? So within a week of the machine being installed, you'll be contacted by our service department to make sure everything's okay. And also then look at offering um, service requirements. So uh, service contracts for machinery. Uh, quite often people will include that in the rental of the machine, but sometimes people like to do it separately. Um, a bit like having, well, go back to the analogy of a car or a forklift, but having them serviced every six months. So at that point then our point, point of contact will contact the site Make sure everything's okay, arrange any service requirements, get them booked in, and um, then we are at the end of the phone. It's, it's as easy as that. Um, it's quite a, we're not a massive business. We're quite, we're small enough to care. So there's no uh, big corporate um, airs and graces about us. It is, if you get a phone call, you'll, you'll end up knowing the people at the end of the phone. We've only got about six people in the office. So you'll know which one you're speaking to. The engineers have their own patch. So we cover nationally. We've got four service vans on the road fully equipped and each engineer has got his own little patch. So when you have someone coming out for a service, they will then, you'll get to know them. They'll be the same person uh, time and time again. So that's quite nice as well. And we get lots and lots of emails and phone calls from customers saying, ah, oh, the engineer that come out today done a really nice job. He was really polite. So that, that's really nice to hear. Um, we get quite a lot of that and I sort of um, tell the guys that that's a great thing. I think they sometimes come to site and push for it a little bit sometimes because they're, uh, we get quite a lot of them, but it's still nice to have people phoning up and complimenting the engineers. But at the, end, the, the engineers are your are the face of the company. Once the machine's in, they are the people that you see on a six-monthly or three-monthly basis. 
So it's important that they get on well with the site. Um, some of the machines will require consumables, so um, a wire or a tape to tie off bales or a bag for the waste to go into. So that's something you will phone up, go through to that department and you'll speak to that person um, ongoing. But say we, we are at the end of the phone, we're local. 80% of our business is probably south of the M4. So we tend to concentrate on the area. We, we've saturated around here quite well. And we can be, you know, if there is a breakdown, God forbid there is a issue with the machine, we will be there quick, you know, same day or the very next working day is what we tell people. So. OK, I think it's actually uh, with what you've said there, it's probably a good idea at this point just to ask you uh, in general, the types of waste that you deal with, just so that people don't you know, put you in one category. They actually can see yeah. the range that you cover. Um, yeah. So, I mean, any recyclable from any form of plastic, polystyrene to cardboard, paper, back to general waste, dry mix recycling, any material, probably I say any, but. 95 percent of the material that any business will produce we can normally do something with we have a machine to do it obviously when it gets down the hazardous side of things it becomes slightly niche and we have contacts we you know we're happy to help we have contacts we can point in the right direction to um but we tend not to do too much with the uh dirty horrible stuff if i'm honest the, the hazardous waste uh, yeah. Yeah. industry sectors we go into hospitals for example they will say have the um the, the yellow has hazardous waste bins. Um, we don't tend to get too involved with that side of things. It's more of a specialist niche. Uh, niche. But say any other any other waste in any industry, such as manufacturing, a um, lot of hospitals, schools, colleges, hotels, uh, you know, big restaurants, lots lots of industry sectors. We we can uh, we can help anyone spending more than 50 60 pounds a week on waste we can normally do something with yeah i think that's a good way of looking at it that people can judge whether they think that they are at that at that uh, time in their waste management that they need to call a company like yourself um this might this question might be how, how long is a bit of string but you know how long do you think companies normally keep their equipment for or do you advise them to keep it or if it's running merrily away and happy you say go on you know if it still meets your requirements I mean, we've, we've had machines out on sites for 20 plus years, um, long, long time. Um, but as a, as a rule of thumb, we normally rent them for five years and then we'll probably rent them again for another five years, the same machine. And then it may come back and we'll give it go through the whole fully refurbishment program in the factory. Then the machine will go out for another five years within like 12 months parts and labor warranty. So, I mean, I would say 15 to 20 years is probably where it is for most waste compactors. If it's on a quite a harsh type of waste, um, we've had some in a uh, soft drink factories, you know, it's quite acidic, orange juice and apple juice that takes away. Um, they don't tend to last so long. And we've designed actually a machine for that, a wet waste machine. So all of the workings is up out of the way of the liquid. Um, so it, they last a bit longer. But as a rule of thumb, 15 to 20 years, I think would probably be where it is. How many, how many things today last 15 to 20 years? That's for sure. So um, if somebody isn't renting and they have purchased outright, I just wanted to cover um, at what point you would discuss that they could bring the equipment back to you at the end of life. Is that something that is goes out with the proposal or? We don't tend to mention it. I mean, the machine, if they, someone buys a machine outright, they're going to be keeping that on that site for a good while. Um, you know, 15 years down the line, they, I would expect them still to be using that machine. Uh, and a lot can change in business in 15 years um so i mean if they were to contact us we can always take it away we quite often get contacted by companies that have either outgrown their machine or have bought it and then bought another one bigger since and say will you buy this one back and we can refurbish it and sell it on to someone else so um we're open to have any of our machines back definitely but as a, as a rule of thumb yeah 15 to 20 years i would say is where the machines are okay well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, extremely useful insights. I think it's good to go through that process so that our listeners can understand what that journey would be like for them if they contact you. Um, we've included a link to the right of this video uh, with the website for Pierce Compaction so you can find out a bit more about the company and you can get in touch with Steve. 
And um, we have um, very much enjoyed listening to you, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching to our listeners and thank you for listening if you're, um, you know, if this is on audio for you and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers, thank you.